So today we're going to take a break from Ezra. I was really excited to continue in Ezra, but you know what? There's a lot going on about the, today's holiday that is connected to what is going on in Ezra. Ezra shows us a fresh start. Ezra shows us people coming together that have their own roles and parts, and they have to work together, as we talked about last week and the week before, with the various Levites having their different roles that all come together to glorify God. Just like last night, there was some of us getting dunked in a tank, some of us walking around entertaining people, some people guiding others tossing a turkey into a lemonade, big two liters, so that they were playing turkey bowling. Some of us doing all kinds of things as we were working together to outreach into our community. And so you might be thinking again, well, what on earth does this have to do with Halloween? Well, it has nothing to do with Halloween. Now, theologically, I don't have a problem with things like pumpkins, right? Okay, I know that the ladies in particular love the pumpkin spice lattes and all that stuff, even though there's not much pumpkin in pumpkin spice or any most of the time. And I have no theological problem with candy. Uh, I do have a problem, or really maybe I should say it causes a problem for me if I eat too much. And so I need to avoid much candy in my life. I've already had my fill. But I also have no problem with costumes. As some of you who were here last night saw that I dressed up and I had fun with the kids, you know, waving and doing things like that. It was great. That's okay. And I have no problem with the imagination side. In fact, G.K. Chesterton says this, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And so I really appreciate kids taking on the guise of superheroes because for many of them, that's one of the first ways that they learn that good can beat evil. And that's an important lesson that they need to learn. They can learn that evil may look big and bad and scary, but it's okay that there is hope. And somebody can come and save the day. And we can use that. I've told you guys before how, you know, I, I'll talk to people who are kind of nerdy or are kids. And if they like Spider-Man, I might say, oh, you know what Spider-Man says, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Well, Luke says, to whom much is given, much is required. That's ultimately tracing back to a Bible quote. Uh, but I'm not talking about Halloween. I'm not talking about anything fantastical today. And I don't have a problem with you going home and, and passing out candy, things like that. Halloween originally was All Hallows Eve. It's actually a day that came before a feast that was supposed to remember all the saints that had come before us. Of course, yes, it has been morphed a bit over the years. But I'm talking about something much more important. I'm talking about Reformation Day, which is so much more important than candy and cosplay. In 1517, 504 years ago, it's hard to believe it's, you know, been that long because I can just remember four years ago when they were celebrating the 500 mark and how big that was. That feels like yesterday. Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, he is said to have nailed his 95 thesis to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, some people think that this is apocryphal, that he didn't actually nail things to the door. He actually just mailed it out. But, of course, the famous painting you saw, and just lots of stories have always included that. And so we don't know for sure. Uh, but this was an explosive moment in church history. And as we're going to see, it's actually an explosive moment in political history as well and just kind of cultural history alike. But before we dig in, I want to remind you why we should care about church history because you might think, well, wait, that's, not, that's well after the Bible times. You know, do we, do we really need to know this, right? And Martin Luther certainly had problems. I'm not pretending he didn't. He, in fact, he had, uh, he, frankly, he said a lot of racist things. I think it's important to remember that he was also taught by a whole lot of racist folks, and they particularly, he had separated and had strong feelings against the Jewish people. But after years and years um, of teaching, they had really divorced themselves from the Jewish beginning of the New Testament, and that influenced the way they observed doctrine. And so that would later, this Protestant Reformation would later lead to what we call the Jewish Reclamation, or a better understanding of how the original audience actually understood Scripture. Uh, but he got the ball rolling, right? An imperfect person who got the ball rolling, and he is a brother in Christ. And we need to know that we're continuing on with many brothers and sisters in Christ before us, and we're working and part of the same body. Ephesians 2.9 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you are also being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. 
So this was going to be a fresh start. And we need to remember that God continually brings about some of these fresh starts. Just like in Ezra, he punished the people, but then he brought the people back. He's called prophets to them, and he's getting them moving in the right direction. And we'll find after the Protestant Reformation, if you go and look in church history, that there's been these multiple times where there has been, in America, what we call great awakenings, right? Some of us have a background in Calvary chapels, and that's kind of the tail end of the Jesus freak movement or the Jesus people movement. And that was another kind of the last great awakening we've had so far. And so that influenced a lot of people. So if there's any time when a system gets really corrupt, God can step in, just like John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, God can raise a son of Abraham from these stones. They were counting on their lineage. And he says, no, 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 you need to count on God. He's the one doing the work. Don't count on your lineage. But they had been. And initially, after the time of Christ, we saw in Acts that we saw that there was a Jerusalem council. But as people had spread out further and farther, they were appointing local leaders. They were appointing a plurality of elders, although it did seem we had guys like Timothy, John, and Titus, who were the senior pastors, that kind of role. Uh, And they were appointing these different peoples all over the place, and they would occasionally get together. But it didn't seem that there was top-down control. Even in the famous Council of Nicaea, uh, shortly after the year 300, they sent different people there for the council because they were dealing with heretics. And well, if we've all kind of spread out and we've all kind of got governing authority locally, well, what makes someone a heretic? What, what should we say, hey, if that church is doing that, we're not going to fellowship with them anymore. And so they're, they're dealing with that. And you know how many the Bishop of Rome, they called him at, at the time, you know, he sent two people. Just two, just like everybody else. In fact, he wasn't there. And so this idea of a monolithic one pope came later. It wasn't in the first 400 years of the Christian church. Um, It wasn't there. And in fact, even then, as they dealt with people, there were always other people, other little groups that were off apart from this big one monolithic thing that we'd eventually call the Catholic Church. And even before the time of Martin Luther, there was what was called the Great Schism, so God is always on the move. He's always kind of purifying his people, and he's all, always calling them to deeper faithfulness. And in this, we had the great schism of 1054 AD with the Western Catholic Church splitting away from the Orthodox Church, and they had Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria as their big cities. Uh, and they would both claim that they're the original church. The Roman Catholic Church would claim, oh, apostolic secession, Peter was the the head of the early church, and so we're the the true official church. And the Greeks would say, no, 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 we have the first two churches in existence. Obviously, we're the original one true church, and you guys are the heretics. So they both excommunicated one another. And that wasn't lifted until the last century. Excommunication is a fancy word that we don't often use here, but there is a basis in Scripture for church discipline, And there's even a point when we recognize Paul says anathema when he talks about someone delivering another gospel. That really, if we translated that, I think some translations will say cursed, it really should be damned. Uh, It is consigning somebody to damnation. And that is a very harsh statement. But it wasn't just this light thing that it had become at that point. It wasn't a matter of they're preaching a different gospel. It became beyond the main issues or essentials and down to all these little other things that they started uh, breaking apart and excommunicating each other over. And they had found that they both groups kind of veered away from the true teaching of Scripture. But if you were going to go and say that uh, Jesus came and he made one organization, well, I got to be honest with you, the Greeks would have the better claim, I think, based on the older churches and and how things worked and, and how close they were to the earlier church. But that's not what God did, right? Just like I said earlier, John told the Pharisees there that, he could ra- that God could raise sons of Abraham from the stones around them. It is not a matter of their lineage. It is a matter of their connection to God and the Holy Spirit. And so God will raise other people up as they walk away. God created an organism, one body, not an organization that is top down. He's in charge, God, not some man-made figure. Uh, And we are not going to get through all the verses that can prove that point, but we're going to get through some in just a few moments. But I want to talk about some other people who set the stage before this explosive event of the 95 Thesis. First up is John Wycliffe. Now, you see, he noticed that the Catholic Church had once translated the Bible into Latin. 
It's what we call the Vulgate because it was the most common language, but it wasn't anymore. And he wanted everything to be translated into the common tongue, and that got him in trouble, right? And so they, there was the Lollards. There were some other groups that would come after him that would follow him, uh, but he was a, kind of a proto-early reformer who was fighting inside the Catholic Church to get people to head in the right direction. And then later on, there was a guy named John Huss. And he says this, seek the truth, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, abide by the truth, and defend the truth unto death. He had decided that a lot of the official church teachings were just not matching the Bible. He wanted everybody to be able to read the Bible, have access to it, and he wanted to go back to what Scripture was teaching and not what man was teaching. He recognized, like many of us do, that when Jesus encountered the Pharisees and Sadducees, he was dealing with man-made traditions of their day and getting onto them for departing from God's Word and building it up and replacing it with these man-made traditions. Now, he was excommunicated, and then they caught him, and then they were going to execute him, and they told him that he could live if he recanted. And he said, I would not for a chapel of gold retreat from the truth. So when he was refused, he was put back in prison for a little bit. And then on the 6th of July in 1415, he was burned at the stake. And supposedly, as they burned him, he could be heard singing psalms. Now, was he a heretic? Did he trust in some other false gospel? No. He just disagreed with the church, his official teachings, that he was making the right case, disagreed with the Bible. So he was standing for truth and refused whether everybody else was going in the opposite direction, he refused to go in any direction but what the direction God was calling him to. He was going to pursue the truth. But then, in a non-theological sense, in 1440, Johannes Gutenberg, there was a printing press prior to him, but he invented movable type printing press. Uh, there was a, in the East, there was a printing press. But for Germany and for that area, he invented the printing press with the movable type, this improvement. And he Later on, he actually refined this and make it more and more um, complex and sophisticated over the course of his life. And so a later model looks something like this. Uh, this is in the Carson, California uh, International Printing Museum. This image is via Wikipedia. And so he made uh, quite a change in technology at the time. And this would be important for when Luther was on the scene. Beforehand, Everything was copied by hand. I don't know if you guys can remember back in school. I don't even know if, if high schoolers do this anymore. But sometimes you, you missed a day and you had somebody hand you their notes from the class and you just had to copy all their notes by hand. Right now, probably it's like copy-paste. Even in college, I can remember, can you just email me the notes? And so that's probably how that goes if you've got a digital version of the notes. Uh, but that was, that's, that's new. But at the time, this was revolutionary. Everything. Every book was super expensive because the time it, was, it took, it was very labor intensive to do every pen stroke was immense. And then you had to go back and check it for accuracy because guess what? You keep copying the same lines over and over and over again, you're going to get tired. You're going to make a mistake here and there. So they had to check everything for accuracy. That meant there were very few books. I've shared this before, but I think this is, you know, a great compliment, and I made my day one time. We had some other event in the fireside room, and my office door was open because it was hot, and they told someone in the front office that, that the door to our library was open because they saw all the books on that one row, uh, on that one wall in my office. And I was like, yes, they think I have a library because I love books. I love digging in and worshiping God with my mind, and we all should. We can learn about His world and His creation. We can learn about Him that way. But that's a new privilege for most people. The Bible that you neglect would have been treasured by some of these people. Some of these people would have been burned at the stake for having it. And they would dig in. They would love every little scrap, even around the world. They would do that. And that convicts me. I try to read the Bible every day, but that still convicts me. Am I taking this privilege seriously enough? How serious would they have taken it? Now, picture this. When Martin Luther comes onto the scene, he is in beautiful Germany, right? Right? Land of nice mountains and castles, you know, more than the VW bug, more than spots in history uh, that were unfortunate, like the Holocaust, right? But there, somebody came up to me after service, after the first service, and said, you know, really nice in Germany. And of course, he mentions their alcohol and sausage. And so there's all kinds of things that Germany is known for today. But at the time, Germany was known um, as the place of the printing press, and it was growing. There was lots of things going there. And Martin Luther, he was coming onto the scene, 
And as he did so, Europe was very different than what we recognize now. Over a third of all land in Europe was owned by the church. Most people, if they met somebody who could read the Bible in their lifetime, it was one person, it was their local priest. Some priests didn't even have a copy of the Bible. Some priests couldn't even read the Bible. And so there was a lot of, well, this is so-and-so's like cousin, and he gets an appointment even though he can't read. He gets to be a local priest and given money by the church. The, the Pope claimed authority over all the kings of Europe because he says that he, or he said he was the uh, descendant or the heir of the Holy Roman Emperor. So everybody answered ultimately to him. And so they had an insane amount of wealth and power. You didn't question them. And Martin Luther comes onto the scene with a chime where he could get those questions into other people's hands. Now, he was a priest, uh, and initially he wanted to be a lawyer, but he was actually struck by lightning during a storm, and he called out to one of the saints, St. Anne, to help him. And in two weeks, he recovered after being struck by lightning. And then he went and he became a monk. And he did well as a monk. And he eventually was sent to Rome on a mission. And it was a diplomatic mission. He was supposed to connect some things with the, the place he was sending them from, you know, to the, the mother city, the big, big city of Rome. And he went there and he was appalled at what he found. As soon as he walked in, he noticed the lavish excess, but he also noticed prostitutes everywhere. He noticed priests going about with immoral behavior, bad-mouthing official church doctrine. And then even when he went and attended what they would call like a church service, a mass, he found that the, the priests were just rushing through it like it was nothing. It was unimportant to them. They were not prepared. They were not ready. It was almost as if they hadn't moved their slideshow back to where it was supposed to be before they started the next service, right? So they were doing all these things and he was upset with it. He did not fit in. He confessed his sin repeatedly. And he kind of got on everybody's nerves. So rather than be there, they decided, you know what? You need to go be a college professor. So they sent him to Wittenberg. And he continued to wrestle with the nature of his own sin because the church was telling him that salvation came from continual confession, from the ordinances like taking communion and being baptized and following all these lists of rules, that even though Jesus allowed him to be saved, he had essentially had to maintain his salvation. And that's a nerve-wracking thing because guess what? You're not able to do that. And he realized that more than others. And so he came upon in Scripture this verse, for it is in righteousness of God for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Now Paul is using Isaiah 46 and combining it with probably his own letter from Corinthians to make this quote, but for Luther this was a game changer. He read this and it clicked for him. Wait a minute. All these things that they're telling me about how I'm saved doesn't match with what Scripture actually says. They say I have to be saved through works. They say I have to be saved through all this stuff. It's faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is trust. He would have been reading in Latin. He would have read fides, and that is trust. It's an active trust. There's this word abiding that is used, and we, we don't use that very often in our common language, but we use it when we read the Bible. It's in there, and it means a continued trust. And because it's in a king, uh, theologian, author, and professor Matthew Bates says a better word is allegiance. I've come to like that word because we're being allegiant to a king. So it is not pleasing the Pope. It is not going through all these things. It is not putting your right arm in, taking it back out, and doing the hokey pokey again. It is not this dance that he has to do. And he found rest, true rest in the salvation of Jesus. And from this, he would develop sola fide, faith alone. And there would actually be five solas that would come out of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Hey, this is our cornerstone, right? Not some other creed, not some other thing outside of Scripture. We measure everything by Scripture. Not some kind of tradition, but sola Scriptura. Sola fide, like I said, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone, not works. God gets the credit, as we're going to see. Solo Christo, or Christ alone. So there's no intercessory priest, right? For them, God was always behind somebody else. To get to God, they had to go to a priest. He said, no, 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 no. You can pray. You can reach out to God. You don't have to go through a bunch of other people to get there. And then finally, sola dia gloria, to the glory of God alone. Not about building earthly kingdoms, not about competing with the priest next down, uh, you know, in the next town over, none of that stuff. It's all about God. It's not about doing works 
just so we could be seen. All of our works are a response to what God has done for us. It is thankfulness. We should be doing something out of our changed lives, but it's a response to how God has saved us. Now, obviously, this contradicted the Catholic uh, teaching, especially at the time, right? The Catholic Church, in response to this, would later reform some of their issues, and it's not the same as it is today. So if I have any Catholic friends listening, it is good news for them, even though we still have intense theological differences. But there came a, a person, a friar named John Tetzel, and he came and he was selling indulgences there in Germany, in Wittenberg. And indulgences were these things that he would say, uh, According to the Pope, your sins will be forgiven if you give me a bunch of money, whatever they are. And this money was used to rebuild the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And sometimes the money would be as much as half a year's wage for the average worker. So this was not a small amount. And Martin Luther was livid. Why are you fleecing these people when all the bishops have all this money? Why are you taking all this stuff? There's nothing wrong with giving church staff a salary, right? Like that's, that's Benefiting for me to say, obviously, but there, there is cost in running a church. There, there are those things, but there are so many people that take it to an excess, right? Nothing wrong with me having my old Dodge Dakota out there, but there is a problem when I see, you know, mansions of these prosperity health and wealth gospels or Creflo Dollar asking for another jet. That's crazy. Like, that is not okay. So we see those kinds of things, and he saw it, and he's like, why are you fleecing these people? And also, so that isn't how salvation works. Guess what? You paid a bunch of money for your sins to be forgiven if you didn't trust in Christ. You just threw a bunch of money away and you still have a sin debt. Man, not only are you still in sin, not only did they not get the real gospel, but now they're poorer. And so Martin Luther was upset and he nailed it. He nailed the 95 thesis to the door, which was about reforms and issues, largely about the selling of indulgences that he had with the Catholic Church. And so he was still a priest at the time. He wanted to reform it from within, but eventually he would be excommunicated. And eventually he would start his own. Of course, we had the Lutherans, and then they split into a bunch of different things. But he would use the biggest technological uh, revolution of his day, the printing press, to spread his questions, right? And influence others and write letters and make copies. And so Calvin and Zwingli and so many others continued on in his work, and it just spread across Europe. And then people started wanting the Scripture in their own languages so that they could understand. So the history of the church is that we've always used technology. You know what compares to the printing press today? The internet. That's why we're out there. There's two cameras right there so we can go online. We live in, uh, first it was TiVo, and then now it's, you know, Netflix, YouTube, or whatever. We live in a time where people want things on their own timing. And un that's unfortunate because you really need to come to church if you're not sick or away or, or something like that, because it's not the same just sitting in your house, right? Yeah, it's great if that's your only option, but you're missing out on the fellowship. Like, this is, this is only part of it. The worship's only part of it. The worship music, that is. We should be worshiping through all of it. We also need fellowship. We also need to be taking communion together. We need to see smiling faces. We need to occasionally have somebody go, hey, last time we talked, I heard you say this. How's it going? You know, we need that kind of follow-up and interaction with people. And when we don't get it, we're not as spiritually healthy. We are not made to live alone, and we're not made to worship just through a screen. But we do need to use the tool that we have, and they did effectively, and it spread across Europe, and it even had political consequences. Some rulers, like uh, King Henry in England, he said, you know what? The Pope's not granting my divorce. There's all these Protestants out there. I think I'll be a Protestant too, and I'll seize all the money in England, and I can divorce and remarry who I want, and then also I can have all the church's power here. And so that's how we got the Anglicans. And this kind of thing continued to happen. And people began to realize, hey, wait a minute, I can have a different theological conviction than the supposed the church, right? Because they were thinking the Catholic church, not the church of all believers. Well, then that means I can have a different idea than my king. And there began to be this ability to question and to learn and to dig in for oneself what we would call being a Berean. It's really, really good. And it brought about a freshness to everything. Now, sometimes they didn't reform enough. And sometimes they threw away the baby with the bathwater, okay? That means they went too far in certain areas or things that they, ah, oh, that looks too Catholic. We won't do it even if it's true. And so it needs to be a pursuit of truth and not automatically accepting an idea because it's new or rejecting it because it's old. And they struggled with this. 
But it does remind me of 2 Kings 22. Hilkiah the high priest had been ordered to go through the temple, and they were renovating it, and he actually found a book of the law that they had not been following. And they brought it to King Josiah, and they read it to him. And he ripped his clothes, which was not a sign that you were Hulk Hogan or anything like that or a wrestler. It was a sign of mourning back then. And so he ripped his clothes in mourning, probably because they had not been following it. And that's what was happening around Europe at the time. Just imagine, you'd heard all these things from a pulpit, all these things from a priest, and you had never been actually able to check the Bible itself. But then when you did, you truly wanted to know God, and you read stuff like this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. And yet you lived in a time when people boasted and did great works and built buildings just to get the credit all the time. And priests said, oh, you need to do all these things and and give this to me and, and all that. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that formerly the Gentiles in the flesh, who you are called uncircumcision, by the so-called circumcision, which is performed by the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at the time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who you formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So God took the penalty of all the sin on himself, but he also in that created a great unifier. Verses like this, it talks about circumcision and uncircumcision. As people read this, they started to realize that maybe what they had been taught about Israel wasn't quite right, and and the Jewish people wasn't quite right. And so eventually we would find from the Protestant Reformation real tolerance, not, not what we modern use the word for, which is often celebrating things that we completely disagree with, but no real tolerance and putting up with one another because you had to because people disagreed. But also, again, it created this appreciation for the original audience, largely Jewish church, and it helped people understand the Old Testament better. They wanted to dig in that way. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Paul's talking to the Gentiles here, but Jesus did interact with some Gentiles, but did he go all the way to Ephesus? No. It seems that Paul's saying that through the church he went out there. And so we see the Holy Spirit is working through the church to reach the Gentiles. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Wait a minute. Fellow citizens equal the saints. They would read things like, wait a minute, what is a saint versus what a priest is telling me a saint is? Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit, one body. In Acts 17.10, they would read, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. They would read that they were allowed to ask questions and dig in. They were told if they had questions that they weren't being faithful, that they need, you know, that kind of thing. They need to just trust the church or that they weren't smart enough to interpret. That doesn't mean every interpretation is equal, but asking questions is a great starting point. You have to be able to ask questions for clarification and to challenge false ideas. And so they were able to do this now, and they were able to see that in Scripture that was the way it was supposed to be. And it creeps back into the, even the Protestant world today where some, some things, oh, you know, some pastor or some high up leader says, no, no, don't ask any question. I'm God's anointed. Don't touch God's anointed. No, nah, no, nah, that's not how it works. Paul commended them when they asked him questions and dug in in Scripture. Don't just blindly accept what I say. Dig in. I want to inspire you to dig in more. And they would read things like this. But you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter wrote that, and he's quoting scripture intended originally for Israel, not saying that the church replaced Israel, but saying that now the church, they each have access to the Holy Spirit. All the members of the body are a part of a royal priesthood, something very different, something closer to God than in the Old Testament. And yet they, at the time, they were seeing this sharp division. Well, here's the clergy, here's the laity. We know all the stuff, and you know nothing, just listen to us. You know, you come, you give us money, and we'll take care of you. That's not the way it works. We're all one body, and we should be serving one another. So I occasionally encounter somebody who says, well, you know, my, my denomination or my church tradition traces back through all these non-Catholic sources or whatever. And there were occasionally groups of non-Catholic Christians out there. But for the most part, that isn't the case. Most of us are impacted by this. But even if not, it had massive cultural changes. So we should be thankful for this day. If you can read the Bible in a language that you can understand, if you can hear it read in a language that you can understand, if you can have a different opinion on a non-essential issue with a fellow church member, if you can have a different religious viewpoint than your pastor or your leader, right, or your elected officials, if you can ask questions, then if you can do these things without having your salvation questioned or being burned at the stake, then we should be thanking God and celebrating Reformation Day. Hey, they're admittingly broken, imperfect people, the Reformers. But man, they started the ball rolling to get us to return to seeking truth. So we should follow John Haas's advice. Seek the truth, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, abide by the truth, that is continue in it, and defend the truth unto death. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we can dig into your word and dig into church history. We see that you have moved throughout church history and we ask that you would continue to move now, even in Visalia. There's over 71,000 admitted non-Christians here, and there are many other Christians who could be called into deeper faith with you. If we're your body, we should be moving. We should be out there ministering to those in need, and we should be ministering to each other inside the body. We thank you for the privilege of being adopted as, as sons and daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.